<laughs> so being a supply chain expert, I don't want, I think the, the time starts. So Professor Shantanu, please, please introduce you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, starting this one. So, uh, you know, it's a real pleasure today to welcome uh, uh, Professor Sunil Chopra, who's a distinguished expert and uh, so a distinguished expert in uh, operations management. And uh, we're extremely glad, sir, that you're you're joining us today. I also note that you're an alumnus of our institute. Uh, you graduated from mechanical engineering in 1981. So it's always a great pleasure to, you know, you know connect back with our alumni. We, of course, have a very uh, strong alumni network. And um, you know we are we are we are glad that uh, you you are engaged with us and particularly since you have a distinguished career in operations management and information systems, uh, you know it's it's great that you are able to deliver an institute lecture for us today. And so we really look forward to your remarks, your your, your lecture. And and with these initial remarks, uh, I would uh, request uh, Professor Gaurav Devedi of our Department of Management Studies uh, to introduce the speaker and also. Uh, uh, you know, uh, take the lecture forward uh, and also moderate the session. So, Gaurav, over to you. Thank you, Professor R. And uh, I'll request Professor Singh from DMS to welcome Professor Sunil first quickly from the Department of Management Studies side. And then I'll introduce the speaker. Thank you. Yeah, th <clears throat> thank you, Gaurav. So, first of all, thank you, Professor Sunil, for accepting the offer. Though Professor Shantanu Dean Academy has already uh, you know, initial remarks he said, but I think it's a wonderful uh, for especially the the people who are working in the area of operation and supply chain domain to hear you, because uh, uh, you don't need actually introduction because your book has done a fantastic job in the country. What you have written, uh, it has a uh, you know uh, people are reading, students are reading, faculty is you know uh, referring that book and giving as a you know. Uh, referring as a textbook for every uh, uh, graduates of uh, uh, you know management science so i think with these words uh, i welcome you and before that i just give a brief to about yourself uh, to the our uh, audience that uh, uh, you are a professor at kellogg uh, you know school of management it's a, it's a popular you know business school in the world there is no need to you know introduce anything and since professor shantanu has already introduced that you are our alumni and 1981, you graduated from mechanical department, and later on you moved to US and you did PhD. I think uh, uh, you fundamentally you work in the area of operations management and supply chain management, and your uh, the book uh, uh, which is uh, supply chain management strategy planning and you know operations uh, has done a fantastic job, and you know uh, that has given a very good uh, you know uh, fundamentals research insight you know uh, on various issues of supply chain management and especially today's pandemic when we see you know the entire world you know in the industry has suffering because of you know supply chain issues logistics issues so i think this initiative of iit delhi to invite you on this particular period where you know uh, resilient supply chain people are talking though people were talking a lot about resilient but now today they have seen they have understood the importance of resilient supply chain management so I think I will not take much time, uh, Professor Sunil, uh, of yours because the lecture is very, very uh, important, relevant, and you know, uh, uh, and many people are waiting for to hear you rather than me. <laughs> so okay, so I will not come between you and the audience. So please, with these words, uh, uh, thank you very much for accepting the invitation, and I think uh, over to you, sir. Uh, Gaurav, do you want to say anything? Yes, thank, uh, thank you, Professor Singh, for the kind words and the welcome from the Department of Management side. Let me formally introduce Professor Sunil Chopra here. Professor Sunil Chopra is the IBM Distinguished Professor of the Operations Management and Information Systems at Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. He is also Deputy Dean of Kellogg School of Management, Northwestern University. As already mentioned in this forum, he is alumnus of IIT Delhi. He completed his BTEC in Mechanical Engineering from IIT Delhi in 1981. Then he completed his master's in 1984 and PhD in 1986 in operations research area from State University of New York, SUNY Stony Brook, and joined the Stern School of Business Administration at New York University as assistant professor. Since 1989, Professor Chopra is with Kellogg School of Management, Northwestern University, where he has held 
various positions such as director of masters of management and manufacturing program department chair senior associate dean and trim dean professor sunil has been honored with many distinguished awards such as sol as expository writing award 2019 by informs informs the leading body of operations research scientists and professors named to the top 30 a list of management academics 2011 outstanding professor award selected iie book of the year of supply chain management which we also talked about and many best professor and outstanding teaching awards as we talked about teaching awards let me quickly also tell you because my many mba students from gms or other issues and many btech students also joined professor sunil chopra teaches operations management supply chain management distribution channel management strategic decision in operation and supply chain dis- designing and managing business processes in fact most of us would be knowing that he has authored one of the best book and most popular book on supply chain management which i already mentioned here apart from the book for teaching textbooks etc he is also providing his insights in the popular media and professor sunil has authored many reputed research papers in top management journals to talk about few journals from only from the last one year manufacturing and service operations management i'm from transportation science in forms journal of computing egr in european journal of operation research production and operations management this in science these are the top leading journal in the field of management specifically operations and supply chain management he has also held editorial position in the many of these leading journals and management science journal and operation research journal these two are the top most in the field of management education and now welcome once again professor chopra over to you for the lecture thank you very much uh thank you very much for all your kind words uh and it's an absolute pleasure to speak to this audience you know i have the fondest memories or uh, as a student at iit delhi for two reasons right i mean one is uh, i think my education at iit delhi was just absolutely outstanding it taught me how to think uh, at my time i became an engineer simply because i did not want to become a doctor no other reason than that uh and you know then i show up at iit delhi and uh you know i joined mechanical engineering because my dad said that's a good place to go i didn't even think about that but i just showed up without any thinking and the education at iit what it did more than anything else was really taught me how to think and uh, in fact you know i've been teaching at business schools for more than 40 years without ever having taken a business course mostly because how i learned to think at iit delhi so i would say i'm very grateful for that and second uh, you know i lived for 5 years in karakoram hostel and my best friends today are still from my hostel we we you know we still get together with our families we celebrated our 50th together our 60th together so uh, you know i'm grateful to iit delhi for many things some of my best friends and i think setting up a foundation which has allowed me to you know achieve a few things uh, in life so uh i accidentally ended up in the field of uh, supply chain management because my research was primarily in the design of communication networks when i did my phd that's where i had focused and after moving to a business school supply chain management seemed interesting because moving goods and packets of information clearly shared something uh so uh, you know what i'm going to talk about today is in some sense uh, a culmination so you know if you want to think of uh, i actually have a survey paper i wrote last year in decision sciences which is roughly around this title which pulls together two or three different streams of research i have been working on for the last 20 years or so in fact the first paper was with a postdoc who came from uh, india uh, usha mohan who is now a professor at iit chennai uh, and uh, that's where i first started my interest in the area of supply chain risk uh, the other area which i'm going to pull together which i've been thinking about 
a fair amount is design of distribution networks, but particularly in the context of retailing. So let me move to the talk and I just want to kind of start with the different pieces of the title. So if you look at the way I've titled the talk, it has three pieces to it. Uh, first is resilience. I think the interesting part is as somebody who's been working in the space of supply chain management for a long time, uh, it's been great to see various heads of state use the phrase. I have no idea the extent to which they understand what they are talking about, but you know, it's good to see presidents and prime ministers talk about supply chains. Uh, so uh, resilience is the context. What COVID really focused people's attention on is disruptions arose. Now, the interesting part is, you know, this is not the first time disruptions have arisen. In fact, over the last 20 years, supply chain disruptions of various types have not been uncommon. They are weather related. In fact, you know, one that got a lot of press was, uh, you know, uh, the Fukushima nuclear power accident, which was, which was initiated by an earthquake and a tsunami. And basically that disrupted all supply chains that had sourcing from that area. So it's resilience is one word I want to talk, which links to disruption risk. The second phrase I want you to focus on in the title is low cost. So while everybody talks about resilience, in fact, my first management paper was a Sloan management review paper from 2004. And uh, it's interesting to see that, you know, what people are talking about now, uh, many aspects we had raised in 2004. So the question to ask is, why didn't people pay attention to these things for the last 18 years, right? Nothing is fundamentally new. This is actually the basic part of management you need to understand, right? I mean, human beings have been doing management for a long time. Uh, uh, in fact, the first time, if you think about it, when a human being, before agriculture, right, killed an animal and consumed the animal somewhere else, Supply chain management was being practiced. So, you know, I mean, we do know quite a bit about supply chain management, but the context keeps changing. This is really the important part, right? And so what happens is, you know, right now everybody's focused on resilience, but I can tell you once COVID is forgotten, people will go back to focusing on low cost. So it's really, why do people forget about disruption risk and resilience? Because cost begins to dominate the discussion and the thinking. So if we offer solutions for resilience that ignore cost, I can guarantee you they are not going to be followed in the long term. The third phrase from the title I want you to focus on in, is industry commons. So this is an important part sort of, you know, from a conceptual perspective, at one level, this is not a new concept. I will but it's a concept I want to talk about which ties things together, right? So let's start with, you know, it's important to understand what is the goal in a supply chain? And it's from there we are going to start, right? So what is a supply chain? It's just everything from the customer all the way to the last supplier who's involved in bringing product to the end consumer. You know, we see this in COVID, a shortage of containers in the right place disrupts supply chain. So, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're a retailer, you don't think about containers, but containers are part of your supply chain. A shortage of chips in the supply chain disrupts the supply chain. It doesn't matter if you are a retailer who's selling toys, who never thinks of chips, but you know, you have to think about those. So that's the first thing I want to point out, right? Now, second, what is the goal? What is it that we are trying to improve or achieve in a supply chain? And I would say it's really, we are trying to create value. And what is the value we end up creating? Well, it's ultimately going to be determined by the end customer. The end customer values the output of a supply chain. You know, say you go to buy a car, that is the maximum price you might be willing to pay for a that car, right? 
Meanwhile, that's what I call the benefit to the customer. Meanwhile, the supply chain, all the suppliers, the warehousing, the manufacturing, the transportation incurs cost. So the difference between how much the customer values the output and all the cost incurred by the supply chain is the real value created by the supply chain. And what we are really trying to do is grow that value created. So what's, you know, after kind of all these years, it's not a very complicated thing. What is it that complicates supply chains, right? We've been doing this for thousands of years, you know, thousands. Think of, you know, the Telawala who sort of brings product wherever, you know, he understands and practices supply chain management in a, in a manner because, you know, it is a key part of his making a living. So it's really important to understand what is it that makes supply chain challenging? What is it that makes value creation challenging? Well, uh, it is challenging for two reasons. So let me just go back for a minute. One reason is, uh, I think we sometimes miss what cost is. Because we focus on what I will call measurable cost. You know, if I'm a car manufacturer and I buy a car seat for, I don't know, 50,000 rupees, I measure that. So that I understand as being part of cost. But it's really important to understand that cost is really total cost. So what we typically measure very effectively is what I call acquisition cost. You know, what does it cost me to acquire something? How much do I pay my supplier? We measure that very well. What we don't measure is sort of, let me just focus on one aspect, is post-ownership cost. So let's just focus, what do I mean by post-ownership cost? A customer comes to me and I'm out of stock of my product. As a result, I lose sales. This, if you think about it, in our financial statements, there is no line that measures. We measure revenue, we measure cost. We don't measure lost sales. In fact, it never shows up in any financial statement. Every time you lose sales, you lose the gross margin, right? That's a big number. Second, which we don't measure very well is, uh, what's the cost of having too much stock? Cost of too much stock is not just the cost of physically holding inventory, it is also capital tied up. And most importantly, it is the discount we have to offer to actually sell the product. So again, we measure revenue received, we do not measure revenue that could have been received, right? So what I really want to emphasize is our first challenge, which, which is easily addressable, but it's important to recognize we are not addressing it very well today, is that when we talk of cost and value created, it should always be total cost. And a lot of the cost occurs because of a mismatch in supply and demand, either in terms of lost sales or in terms of the discounts we have to offer to sell products. This leads me to, you know, the core issue. Why is supply chain, why is value creation difficult? It's basically because of risk or uncertainty. If we could predict everything perfectly, supply chain management is actually pretty easy. There's, you know, I mean, it's, if you know exactly what's gonna happen six months into the future, you don't need to hire managers. The computer can do everything for you, right? So it's really uncertainty or risk that makes things difficult. And in terms of risk, I'm going to ask us to focus on two types of risk. The first is what I call recurrent risk. What is recurrent risk? It's like uh, uncertainty we face on a daily basis. You know, a car dealer does not know how many cars will sell this week. A retailer does not know which products will sell today. So demand is fluctuating. Input prices might be fluctuating. There are various uncertainties. You know, the cost of transportation may be fluctuating. These are what I call recurrent risk. And the way to think about recurrent risk is it is uncertainty that is on an ongoing basis. Its impact is not very large. Yeah, demand is 
20, 50% higher today than yesterday. But you know, what I can do here is I can look at history and begin to estimate recurrent risk. So I want us to observe that. Right? Well, what do we do? We forecast. And what is what is the recurrent risk? It's forecast error. And how do we react to forecast error? We react to forecast error by building buffers. You know, a retailer holds inventory, a manufacturer might have excess capacity, uh, uh, somebody might actually use a faster mode of transportation, uh, and so on and so forth. These are all examples of buffers. They are inventory buffers, capacity buffers, or time buffers. And in some instances, we deal with recurrent risk through pricing. In fact, that's what's happening right now. There are various supply shortages which are leading to inflation. What is inflation? Because you cannot adjust to the variability either through inventory, you don't have enough inventory, or through capacity or just through pricing. The most extreme of that, of course, is what happened with crude oil, which a year and a half to two ago traded one day for negative $30 a barrel. Today it is trading for more than $100 a barrel. Can you see it's really price that is adjusting to recurrent risk. But there's a second important risk, which is where the title comes from, which is disruption risk. These are pictures from uh, the Fukushima incident. And uh, here, when it comes to disruption risk, you know, the question really is uh, actions we take to deal with re recurrent risk do they work or not when it comes to disruption risk? So the question becomes, how do we build resilience? And most importantly, at what cost? Okay. So this is where I am going to introduce the notion of commons. So let me give you first a little history. The word commons actually goes back hundreds of years to English villages. You know, so we are primarily, the world is primarily an agricultural society. Uh, people are doing agriculture or raising animals. So what was a commons? A commons was a plot of land in the village that was shared. And this is the key phrase. All people that were raising animals shared that land for grazing. So their animals could go to that land, anybody's animals, right? And share and graze, eat the grass. That's all. So that was the commons. And you see where the word commons, and you know, you can see it's become sort of uh, uh, used more uh, in a variety of settings. You know, it's just an area where, which is shared, where people get together. Right? It has been used in a variety of settings. So I want to start by just getting, giving you an example of one of my favorite commons that I used extensively as a student. I have no idea. I've not been there for 40 some years, but going to Naisarak to buy my books. I don't know if people still go to Naisarak or not, but you know, at my time and you know, I still remember the mechanics book, res, you know, and we had we uh, there was no Indian version published. We had to buy the uh, foreign used version, so we would go to Naisarak. And the way to go to uh, buy at Naisarak was, uh, you know, I would go to somebody, one of the retailers, and I would give that retailer my book list, and the retailer would take out the two books that they had. And for the three books they they did not have, they would tell me, you know, punch minute rukiye, ma be lekar And basically, now you think about this, right? This was a set of retailers. It was not one retailer. It was it was almost think of it like a book mall, but it was more than a book mall because they shared inventory, right? So it's a commons. It was a commons created. It was a physically created commons by competing players. Did this commons because it added value for everybody involved. 
in a supply chain, there are three fundamental flows. There are flows of information, there is flow of product, and there is flow of funds. Now you can see how this commons actually made all three flows more efficient, both from the customer's perspective, as well as from the retailer's perspective. From my perspective as a customer, I just went to one retailer with my five books, that's it. You know, I didn't need to go and search. My search cost was zero. Why? Because the commons had already done the search, right? Second, in terms of flow of product, primarily, if every retailer held inventory, you would need a lot more inventory than what the commons was holding to meet demand. So it was getting the benefit of aggregation without having a single monopoly. Third, funds. Now imagine I could of course have gone and bought the book from the three different retailers that carried the five books. I would have had to pay each one. So it is a less efficient flow of funds as well. So commons, the nice sort of commons really was growing the value created. Right, so I'll just leave it at that. What we will see later is well-designed commons, not only do they grow the value created, they also improve resilience. And this is sort of kind of an example that I want to give you. So let me just give you one example of the nicer commons, right? How is resilience improved? Well, at least resilience to financial disruption gets improved significantly here. The failure of one retailer really does not affect the customer or the commons ability to deliver, right? Uh, we can think of how different commons improve different types of resilience, right? So this hopefully is kind of the setup that leads to the key questions that I want to address in this talk. The first question is, does resilience always come at the expense of efficiency? And I'm going to give you, there are many instances. See, eventually to build resilience, you have to pay a price, right? It's like we buy life insurance. We buy life insurance and you have to pay a premium. I mean, life insurance doesn't come for free, right? So to build resilience, ultimately you have to pay a price, but I'm going to give you several examples and retailing will be an important focus where uh, scale allows you to build resilience at low cost. In fact, in many instances for free. Then comes, you know, what is sort of the core, core idea that allows us to grow resilience at low cost? And this is where I'm going to talk about industry commons. And, you know, industry commons can be of two or three types. One is the one that I showed you, where at NYSERAC, the competitors themselves organize the commons. Sometimes it can be a commons within a company. And sometimes it can be a third party that organizes that commons where that third party could be a private player. Think about it, ultimately Google is a commons that allows us to do search, right? It's an information commons. So it could be a third party or it could be the government. What is infrastructure? It's a commons, right? So I, I'm just trying to get you to start thinking about uh, the idea of the commons, okay? So, uh, uh, I will focus on retailing and you know, I'm going to use the US con context sort of to motivate my ideas. But really, I will tell you honestly, uh, a lot of my thinking in this space was driven by thinking about India. In fact, my first article pushing some of these ideas, I didn't call it commons then, you know, commons is sort of, a, it's my thinking has come around to commons more recently. Uh, but my first article related to this appeared in the Economic Times in 2014, where I was pushing my ideas. I'm glad to see that, you know, now uh, people are beginning to think about this. And in fact, some implementations have also occurred. But let's start with the US con context, right? And here, to me, it's kind of, COVID was very interesting because it was simultaneously the best of times for some retailers 
and the worst of times for other retailers, right? So to name two or three, you know, in the US, Walmart, Target, and Amazon did very well. Whereas there's a very long list of retailers that just collapsed during COVID. What I really want to emphasize is that Walmart and Target actually have used COVID to become more established, especially in online commerce than they were before. So during COVID, Walmart and Target increased revenues and profits. So here was an interesting part. A disruption occurs, and here are two companies that not only sell more than they were selling before, they also sell it more profitably than they were selling before. Amazon, of course, increases revenue, but relatively speaking, it does not increase profits as much, right? So I want to focus on what is it that Walmart and Target, what is it that allowed them to be both resilient and profitable at the same time? And I'm just going to, again, use the idea of commons. So a retail store. A retail store is a resource. So remember, what is commons? Commons is just nothing but a shared resource. A retail store is a resource. What do companies typically use a retail store for? They typically use a retail store for storing inventory. So there's stuff sitting in the retail store that customers can walk into, select, buy, pick up, and leave. Right. Historically, retail stores were a channel not shared with the online channel. In fact, in the late 90s, 96, 97, when Barnes and Noble and Borders were the first ones, they had big bookstores, but they also set up the e-commerce channel. If you walked into the bookstore, you didn't know Borders.com existed. And what did Target do? It basically said, look, hey, my store is a shared resource. So I really don't care whether you place your orders online or you place your orders by coming to the store. I can allow you to pick up your order in any way you want. So notice, suddenly, the retail store becomes a shared resource. And the retail store was serving orders with inventory that were not stocked at the store. The inventory might have been coming from a distribution center, which was more centralized, right? And uh, basically what happened is the following. A disruption occurred, but Target found alternate channels, shared channels through which information could flow. So customers could not walk into a retail store at the beginning of COVID, no problem. You can use the online channel to place orders for stuff that is in the store. Product, well, historically, I might have tried to deliver an online order to your home, but no, what I can now do is actually bring the product to the store for your pickup if needed. And funds sort of, you know, is more shared historically. So this notion of shared channels, which is an internal commons that Target had created. So the question that arises is, stores like Target and uh, Amazon, uh, my Target and Walmart, did they create this structure because they were anticipating a disruption? Or did they create this omni-channel structure because that is really what grows value. Do you see my point? It allowed them to be resilient, but I'm going to in the long term argue that really it is not about resilience. It's about value. And if you look at the total cost of ownership and try to create value appropriately, you can often get a lot of resilience for free. I want to start with one of my favorite all-time examples that I have used multiple times for the last 20 years uh, to sort of, you know, really give you an example that resilience does not always come at the expense of efficiency. 
And the example is a factory, a Philips semiconductor factory. It's a semiconductor manufacturing factory based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The year is 2000. The month is February or March, I forget. And uh, there's a storm in the city of Albuquerque. Lightning strikes the electric grid. There's a surge. There's a fire in the plant. The fire department comes and puts out the fire. But in the process of putting out the fire, they destroy all the inventory. It then takes a month before the plant can come back online to produce. The plant has two major customers. One is Nokia and the other is Ericsson. It tells you how much has changed in 22 years. You know, these two companies don't even produce phones anymore. Uh, so what happens is the following. Nokia has an alternate supplier. So notice there is a commons here. What do I mean by an alternate supplier? I have the shared ability to produce. What they are able to do is within three days, they are able to switch from this plant to another plant and they are able to continue serving the market. Ericsson had single sourced from this plant. Questions which we need to be thinking about it. Why did Ericsson single source? Why did Nokia had all, have alternate suppliers? And I'm going to simply argue the following. Nokia had enough scale that multiple suppliers made sense without loss of efficiency. This is the key point I want to emphasize. So Nokia got resilience in some sense for free. Let's apply this in the context of retail, right? So again, my key point will be, you can get resilience for free and let's apply this in the context of omnichannel retail. So what is retail? Retail is nothing but, I make stuff one place, my customer is somewhere else, how do I get product from where I make it to where the customer is? And retail is a channel that allows us to do that, right? So what we are really asking is, how should I distribute my product to the customer? And what I'm gonna argue is that the answer really depends upon aligning three factors. One is, what's the product? You know, a product could be I'm buying salt. A product could be I'm buying a television. Second, what is the customer need? Now, this we can define in many senses, but I'm gonna focus on two simple ones. Am I price sensitive or am I service sensitive? Let me just give you an example. My wife and I, we take a morning walk and you know, as I get older, I have to take more care of my ankles and knees. And so I change my shoes regularly. During COVID, you know, I forgot. So I realized I need to change my shoe and I don't have, so I always keep a backup. So of course, what did I do? I got online and I ordered a shoe for delivery today. But then now I need a backup. So notice in the first case, I wasn't worried about price. I probably paid a few extra dollars. I don't remember, but now I need the backup. And being a supply chain person, I said, you know, hey, now I'm not, I'm not going to use the backup for another three to four months. Let me try to find the cheapest shoe. And I searched and I was able to find a shoe with $10 less, which would take three extra days to arrive. And it was from a different retailer. So I, I want us to understand that customers can, even the same customer for the same product can sometimes be price sensitive, sometimes be service sensitive. So what is the product? What's the customer need? And then third, we need to align is what is the channel strength? And here, the basic idea I have uh, to convey is no channel, no supply chain piece can do everything very well. But every supply chain piece can do something very well. And that's really the key point to understand. So the goal will be, what's a good omnichannel structure? You come looking for salt. I'm taking something, or you come looking for dhania. You know, it's a very simple thing. Well, there are two situations you might come looking for dhania. 
right? Number one, uh, it's my weekly, it's Saturday or Sunday, I'm doing my weekly shopping. So as part of, uh, part of buying my vegetables, I also buy dhania. Number two, dinner is being cooked at home. It's I'm making this up, it's Thursday night and we are out of dhania. We have everything else, you know. Notice the two situations are different. Same product, but in one case you're service sensitive, in another case you're price sensitive. And the question that arises is how will I best serve you in those two situations, okay? So let's first look at product. Here's just some examples of products. And you know, how do we categorize products? Well, there are many dimensions we can consider and I'm gonna really focus in on three. The first is the value of the product. Is the product very expensive or cheap? Is it low cost? Detergent is cheap, diamonds or cars are expensive. Second, how predictable is demand for this product? Well, demand for detergent is easy to predict. You know, we use detergent in a very steady rate. Uh, demand for diamonds can be very difficult to predict because each specific diamond is different, for example, right? Third is information content. How much information do I need to convey to a customer in order for them to understand the product and make a decision whether they were going to buy it or not? So for example, when you go to buy a shoe, you want to try it. What does trying mean? Trying means there is information which cannot be conveyed other than by my putting the shoe onto my foot. So information content is this third piece, right? Now let's look at channels. And channels are actually, there's a continuum of channels, but I will really break it up into four channels depending upon how information is exchanged and how product is exchanged. Information can be exchanged face to face. So I walk into the Kirana store, I see uh, some namkeen and I point to that. Oh, I want that pack. Or I pick up that pack, depending upon how the store is structured, right? So this is face to face information exchange. Remote is, you know, uh, I go online, but it could be a catalog, it could be an advertising flyer, it could be anything, but it is, I'm not next to the product. Then in terms of the product, I can pick up the product. You know, I go to the Kirana store and I come back with rice, or I can have the product delivered at home. And this leads to four types of channels. What I've called traditional retail, and this is a little, because I know in India, traditional retail is used a little bit differently. You know, for me, whether it's a supermarket, a mall, or my Kirana store, they are fundamentally all the same because they are a physical outlet that is close to the customer. So when I, if I go to a mall, it's the same structure as the uh, Kirana store. I see the product face to face and then I pick up the product. The other extreme is what I'm calling online. Right, I mean, historically Flipkart, I would go order online and Flipkart would have the product delivered to my house. But there are two other channels, you can see which automatically present themselves. One is a channel where I go to the store to look at the product, but then the product could be delivered to my house. So, um, you know, this is often, for example, how you might buy a washing machine. You know, you don't go with your car and bring the washing machine in your car. You go look at the washing machine at the store where it is displayed, and then they deliver it to your house, right? So it's where the store is working like a showroom. Uh, the last one is what the example of Target I gave you, where I'm placing an order online, but then I go to the store for pickup. Right? So these are the four channels. And our real question is, depending upon the product, whether I come to it for price or value, how do you select the appropriate channel to serve me? And I want to do this in a way that adds value. So right now I'm not even thinking about resilience. That's the point I want to emphasize, okay? So let's see how we can think about this. And I'm gonna, illustrate it using financials from just a few firms. 
to get to my core message. So let's start with diamonds. I'm just using diamonds as a surrogate for a high value, high uncertainty, high information content product. And this, you know, is an industry that I became very interested in uh, actually in the 90s uh, because uh, it's fundamentally undergone a supply chain disruption. In the last 15 years, three of the largest jewelry chains, chains in the United States have declared bankruptcy. A fourth one was had to sell itself because it could not survive. There were, however, two companies that did fairly well during this period. One is a company called Blue Nile, which essentially sells diamonds online. Another is Tiffany, which is a classic jewelry chain. So I would say, you know, now, for example, if I go to Hyderabad, there is the concept of a chain. But, you know, I remember going to Hyderabad where Mangatrai for years had one store. You had to go to that Mangatrai store to buy whatever it is that you wanted. Now, Mangatrai, I don't know, in Hyderabad has 15 or 20 stores. So even Mangatrai is a chain, just if you start thinking about it. And here, what I want you to focus on are the financials. How do these companies succeed? Right? What is it that led to their success? Let's start with Blue Nile. If you look at Blue Nile, oops, my apologies. Uh, if you look at Blue Nile, what I want you to focus on is its low costs. It carries very little inventory, five weeks of inventory compared to 70 weeks for Tiffany. It is able to use its infrastructure very well property, plant, and equipment turns, which is nothing. How much revenue do they get per dollar invested in infrastructure? Look at it. Blue Nile is getting $50 of revenue per dollar invested in infrastructure. Tiffany is only getting $5 of revenue per dollar invested in infrastructure. And I can add to this list, but Blue Nile is low cost for one simple reason. They run a centralized model. They have two warehouses through which they serve the whole world. So they're able to centralize their infrastructure, their people, and their inventory. As a result, they are profitable by having a very small markup, which means they can discount. They discount their product by 25% compared to most retailers. Now it's shrunk a little bit. So they succeed because they are low cost. So now comes the question, how does Tiffany, which is fundamentally a high cost model, it has a chain, it has products sitting all over the place, it has high inventories, high infrastructure costs, all those stores add to cost, how do they succeed? They succeed because of a strong brand for which there are enough people who are willing to pay a premium, right? Just to give you an idea, you can go to eBay and buy empty blue boxes which, sell tif which say Tiffany. You know, they have nothing in them, and you might have to pay $100 to $150. So it tells you that they have a strong brand, right? So the idea to keep in mind is the following, that here is a channel that can compete on cost, so it can attract price-sensitive customer. But this channel can also succeed as long as it provides some service for which customers are willing to pay a premium. So that leads me to kind of the first part of my framework for value creation. Centralized models for products like diamonds, which are high value, high uncertainty products can compete on price, whereas decentralized models must compete on service. Now let's just flip things around. It's a very different product. It's the opposite of diamonds and the sense is cheap. Consumption is stable, and you don't need to touch, feel, or see a bag of salt, diapers, or whatever it is. You know what it is, right? So here, if we look at the cost structure, it's kind of interesting. You can look at a retailer like Costco, a cash and carry with 800 locations. You can look at an online player like Amazon, and we can compare their financials. And it's very interesting. I want you to see that actually the financials of Costco are lower cost. This is what I want to emphasize. So here, 
You have a retail chain which is lower cost than Amazon. Why? For two reasons. Number one reason, Costco does not carry a wide variety of products. It only carries products. It only carries four to 5,000 products that sell in large quantity and are predictable. Second, Amazon incurs the last mile delivery cost. Uh, you know, I, I, I have cried myself hoarse, uh, but you know, hey, look, uh, Investors should throw money if they have surplus money wherever they want to throw money. But in my experience, when companies that do last mile delivery start getting valuations of tens of billions of dollars, bad things are going to happen. I mean, that's just my experience. You are too young, but believe it or not, this is not the first time people thought that we could do this. What you should go and investigate is a company called Webvan. It is from the 90s. Uh, you know, you're young enough, you've probably never heard of them. Uh, but they were the largest IPO of the 90s. And what were they trying to do? They were trying to deliver groceries to people's homes. I'm just trying to tell you. I'm not saying it cannot be done. It can be done, but we have to recognize that it costs money to do last mile delivery. That's all I'm saying, right? Okay, so then that leads me to my basic framework, which says, well, it depends on the product. So now notice how I'm trying to position things. I'm trying to say, look, depending upon the product, you have an efficiency diagonal. For products like detergent, diapers, salt, milk, etc., the decentralized inventory model is actually lowest cost. If you want to attract price sensitive customers, that's what you have to do there. On the other hand, for high uncertainty, high value products, actually the centralized inventory model is low cost. So if you want to attract price sensitive customers, that's what you have to do. So there is an efficiency diagonal, but there's also a service diagonal. It is not that the other diagonals don't work. They do work, but they have to offer some service for which customers are willing to pay a premium. So the idea here is to recognize that no channel does everything well, but a collection of channels, omni-channel, actually can do everything well if we use those channels appropriately, right? This brings me back to where I had started. What is it that Target and Walmart did? How did they use this, right? Very simple. If I look at the retail stores, what do they stock at their retail stores? The fastest moving items. For that, there is nothing cheaper. So it says, if you are price sensitive for these daily demand items, come here, buy, pick them up from my retail store. What do they stock online? Now, Walmart stocks 100,000 items at its store, but Walmart.com sells 10 million items. So it does not stock the fast moving items centrally, it stocks the slow moving, high variety, high value items centrally. Then what does it do? It also uses as a showroom. Here's an example of what it uses as a showroom. You want to buy one of those monster televisions. They cost a lot of money and they are very large. Well, you come to the store, there'll be one such television, you look at it, you say, I want it and we'll deliver it to your house. Furniture, white goods, right? And then finally, <laughs> it also allows people to pick up stuff. How does it use the store for pickup? It uses the store for pickup for people who don't want to pay for last mile delivery or who want greater variety quickly because it takes me longer to bring your order to your specific house than it does to bring it to the store. So, you know, I can get a store order delivered this evening if I place it in the morning, if I'm going to, if I'm willing to pick it up at the store, if I want it at home, it will come tomorrow or day after. Does that make sense? So in some sense, you see this omni-channel structure and here what they are doing is they are using channels as commons. The retail channel 
is serving multiple roles. The online channel is serving multiple roles. This is a key element. Now, Walmart, of course, is large enough that it has the scale to create an internal commons. Question arises, what can small companies do? Well, this is where third parties have been working on creating commons. Commons for information product and fund flows. And I want to just talk about a couple of them, right? Let me start with Shopify. I don't know if you've heard of Shopify, but Shopify is one of the largest sort of uh, players which started by allowing small retailers to set, quickly set up an online store. So think of them, they were really trying to create an information commons. But what they realized during COVID, that alone is not sufficient because it's not sufficient for a small retailer to be able to gather an order. They also had to deliver that order. So what Shopify has now started to invest in is both warehouses and coming up with plans for last mile delivery. Let's look at UPS and FedEx. Both have essentially dropped Amazon as a client. FedEx did this a few years ago, said no more serving Amazon because it doesn't add value to a large player. We are only focused on small players and small players, we will use our entire warehousing and distribution network. Look at Alibaba, look at Amazon. This is what they do, right? I mean, this is Alibaba has started with an information commons, but then it spent most of its money in China on building warehouses and last mile delivery networks. So small companies need external commons. And now notice once the commons, whoever had commons available, they did this for efficiency. They did this to create value. When did it benefit them? When COVID hit, whoever was using the commons, no problem. They continue to serve their customers, right? They got resilience for free. This is where I'm gonna kind of close with the suggestion I've been making for India for a long time, but it requires investment in commons, which some companies are beginning to do. And I wanna start with an example from Japan. One of my absolute favorite companies, 7-Eleven Japan. And uh, you know, it's a very interesting story because 7-Eleven is a convenience store chain that originated in the US in the 20s. They gave their first franchise to the Japanese, a Japanese company, Ito Yokado, in 1973. They opened their first store in 1974. Today, they have more than 20,000 stores in Japan, but the most more interesting part is 7-Eleven Japan owns 7-Eleven US because 7-Eleven US went bankrupt in 1990 and was bailed out by 7-Eleven Japan. So the CEO of 7-Eleven US, who is a former student of mine, reports to the CEO of 7-Eleven Japan. And what are they? They are essentially, and I'm going to kind of phrase it differently. They are a commons linking Kirana stores. That's what they are. In Tokyo, you don't have to walk more than 500 meters to hit another 7-Eleven. It's just like going from one Kirana store to another. You know, my Family home is in Jaipur. There's one Kirana store across the street. Uh, there's another Kirana store 200 meters away. There's a third Kirana store 500 meters away and so on and so forth. That's 7-Eleven Japan. Where's the commons? 7-Eleven Japan invested in an ISDN network for their stores in 1990. Think about it. 7-Eleven Japan stores had an internet when Jeff Bezos had not heard about the internet. Only academics and, and we didn't call it the internet. We, you know, it was called Gopher in those days. You can see where the name comes in. It was primarily used. I could go in and pick up files that were kept elsewhere. That's why it was called Gopher. But they had invested a billion dollars because these are franchises. These are really individual Kirana stores. They are not owned by 7-Eleven Japan but they created an information commons. They created a delivery commons. 
they manage delivery to each store. All the store does is manage ordering. Then how do they use it? This is, it's basically, they are a very important piece of omnichannel retailing in Japan. They, of course, carry the 3,000 most popular, most sold items locally. Of course, they carry those. So they behave like traditional retail. But you can go into a 7-Eleven, you can pay by cash, you can place an online order or home delivery if you want, but you can also go back there and pick it up. And this is not just online orders with 7-Eleven Japan. You can order with Amazon and pick it up at 7-Eleven. In fact, the favorite people don't want home delivery because, you know, I mean, I don't know if you've been to Tokyo, you, you know, if most people are not going to be home. And if you're not home, there's no place to leave the box. So people prefer, on the other hand, there is a Kirana equivalent of a Kirana store right next to you, right? So what I want you to see is that it's really this structure which creates omni-channel that is giving both efficiency and resilience. So no matter where the breakdown occurs, this omni-channel network continues to serve people very effectively. So let me close with kind of the story I've been trying to sort of push in India for at least since 2014, when I first wrote about this in the Economic Times, uh, is well, just look at what I just told you. We in India, I think, are very fortunate to have some incredible assets already in place. And what is really missing are good commons that allow them to be much more effective. Because to me, I just took, took the Kirana store, but it couldn't, it could be anything. It could be a medical store. It could be a little cell phone store. It could be, I mean, you name it store, you know, uh, rather than go and build malls, in my opinion, in my opinion, you know, the malls are dying here. Just, I'm just trying to tell you that, right? Rather than build malls, we should be thinking about how we can use these existing assets more effectively. And to me, that's the picture, right? Uh, and you know what I'm hearing at Geo is at least they are thinking this way. I know Amazon is trying in different ways to get this going. I know Flipkart is trying. So at least the experiments are beginning in this manner. But the key is this requires commons. This is, you know, you can't succeed. Notice 7-Eleven Japan, if you were to ask them, are you a retailer? They said, no, we are not a retailer. We are really an information and distribution company because we provide information and distribution commons. Actually, now they are also a bank, which is again a commons because you know they were settling with every retailer all the time, but now every 7-Eleven store has an ATM. So they provide the commons for information, product, and fund flow. So what's needed? An information commons linking these I'm focused on Kirana stores, but small outlets. These are incredibly valuable. You know, one could argue we have too many of them in India, but I would hate for them to be destroyed because in the US they are now being recreated. So first is you need a good information commons linking. Now there is an opportunity at the private sector level, but you know, there's also an opportunity at the government investment level. Second, this really requires a strong education and training commons. Because in some sense, you know, for these store owners, we are now going to start, we are going to ask them to start operating as stores, as showrooms, as pickup locations, as last mile distribution hubs. If they are able, if they are if they are themselves to be able to perform multiple roles, it requires a lot of education and training. And then finally, it requires the distribution commons. Actually, you know, on the distribution commons side is where I would say we have made the most progress in uh, India. Uh, the e-commerce players have distribution commons. There are third party logistics providers that have created distribution commons. But these commons are important if we are to succeed. So. Let me just close at this point because I've already gone past the hour. I'll take questions at this. 
I want us to observe the following, really. We started with resilience. And then the key question, because, you know, I've been trying to push resilience through multiple disruptions. And during a disruptive period, people listen to me. Six months after the disruption, people ignore, you know, I can't talk about resilience. So what is really important is to think about what are the ways we can build resilience for which we are not paying a lot. Now, paying a lot really needs to be understood in a supply chain because in a supply chain, you will either pay early, upfront, or late. Look, when do I pay early? If I build flexibility, either by carrying inventory or excess capacity, I'm paying early. When do I benefit? I benefit late when there is uncertainty. If I don't build the buffer of capacity of inventory, I'm not paying early. So it looks like I'm saving cost. But when will I pay? I will pay late. I will pay late when there is a disruption or demand is higher than anticipated. So remember, in a supply chain, you're always going to pay. You have to decide whether you will choose where to pay by paying early or you will let the supply chain choose where it will make you pay by paying late. And if we take that into account in the context of total cost, we simply focus on value creation, we often end up with supply chain structures, which are what I will call omni-channel or hybrid, that use commons, being resources that perform multiple tasks. Now, I think in retailing in India in particular, I think there is a huge opportunity here because like we did with cell phones, you know, we just bypassed the communicate. We never had to build landlines to that extent because we just jumped forward. I think in retailing, there is that opportunity. Now, again, you know, this is somebody who does not live in India. I visit India frequently. So you can take everything I say with the appropriate amount of salt, but you know, my opinion is that we are often investing in the wrong places uh, and really investing in making sure that these distributed, small, local. So in fact, you know, a concept that has become very popular in the West now is what's called hyper-local retailing. Oh, that's your Kirana store. That's the lady selling vegetables on the tarp outside. You know, that's hyper-local retailing. I mean, how much hyper-local, how much more hyper-local can it get? But what we are missing is we are not providing the appropriate commons which allow these hyper-local locations to maximize the value that they can create. I think that is where the real opportunity lies. If we were to do that, we would get both value and resilience. Think about it. One Kirana store can have a problem, but you know, I just walk another 300 meters, I have another Kirana store. So in some sense, there are, you create so many alternate channels that you get both value and resilience. I'll stop at this point. Thank you for your patience. I will take any questions that there may be. Thank you, Professor Sunil, uh, for wonderfully summarizing all the frameworks which we learned over the last 10 years or we can learn in the next 20 years also and we try to teach these things to our students in the 42 hours or 82 84 hours of lecture so the floor is open for the question answer uh, i believe we can start with the means where we entered so first question raksha you may ask because we ended at commons and etc so what is the first question good evening sir Thank you so much for the session. It was really informative. Uh, I had this question that in the starting, you talked about new Sadak market, nice Sadak market, uh, where there was a common inventory. So how to build this kind of trust culture among retailers or suppliers in today's competitive world? Well, I don't think the world was less com com competitive 45 years ago. I would argue, argue it was at least as competitive 45 years ago. Right. So that's the first point I want us to observe. Uh, the second point I want to observe is that ultimately there are two things that matter. You have to start looking at total value created. 
right? You have to look at the total value created. That's the first point. Second point is how does that value get shared? So a very important element that had to be occurring at Nysadak was the following. When you are holding inventory and I go to you to get that book, there is a prearranged transfer price that has occurred between us, right? Because you had the inventory of the book, so clearly you did not give me the book at cost. I sold the book, so I did not buy the book at retail price either, because I am bringing the customer, you have the product. So ultimately, it's really a question of transfer price. So I think what we have to start thinking, so trust, to start with trust is very hard. On the other hand, to start with value, I think is easier. Trust comes over time. If people see that participating in the commons actually provides value. Now, I'll give you one example where it fails. So the example is from, and you have to be very careful when you handle this. Uh, this is where small and large come in, and you'll see the importance of designing a commons appropriately. So this was an experiment done by General Motors about 18 odd years ago in uh, the state of Florida. So again, you know, the, we didn't call it commons then, but they said there is a lot of value to carrying inventory centrally rather than carrying inventory of cars at each dealership. So they chose their Cadillac division and they said, what we will do, they told their dealers, rather than carrying inventory with each of you, we will build a central warehouse where we will carry inventory that each of you can access. Okay. And we will run this pilot for a year and after that decide if we should make it permanent or not. So notice they created a commons. Uh, okay, initially the dealers agreed. At the end of the year, GM declared that the pilot was very successful in the sense they had been able to serve customers better with lower levels of inventory. The follow-up announcement was, and we are discontinuing the pilot. We are not going to follow through on this. So question, why? Why, you know, you had a commons experiment that succeeded that they could not implement. It's a very simple reason. Ask yourself, is the value of the commons greater for a small dealer or a large dealership, maybe with multiple locations? And what you will see is the value of the commons is much greater for a small dealer. In fact, creating the commons equalized the small and the large. And so the large dealers who were the bulk of the dealership said, yeah, yeah, the experiment may have succeeded, but we are not going to be with you if you implement this. And this is the point that I'm trying to emphasize. Actually, the biggest beneficiaries of commons tend to be the small players. So in some sense, you have to be thoughtful. Uh, you know, and this is again, it's like uh, I have to say, uh, I've been kind of uh, shouting this for a while and, uh, you know, I'm an academic, so I can say anything I want. The people that implement and run businesses, they don't have to listen to me. So uh, I have to say people don't always listen to this idea, but I, what I'm really trying to push through is that it's the small players. So it's when you combine, again, going back to, remember, not every channel, not every structure is going to be able to do everything well. So when we provide a commons, see where it adds value. So to me, finally, you know, the, the thought of Amazon and FedEx partnering is actually completely ridiculous. It's two large players working together. And I have to give credit to FedEx management that about three years ago, they said, you know, the one company we are not going to do anything for is Amazon. And then they said, well, now we are going to refocus entirely on small players. So it's a long answer to your question, but really it says, think about where value is created. Thank, Thank you, sir. And uh, 
Means to add to the answer, means uh, Mr. Priyanshu Dixit also asked a similar question to how to balance between the directed or in, uh, intended strategy and emergent strategy. This is the summary of this question. A long question is written there. So how to balance between them? Means so we all know that what is intended or directed will not be implemented. So how to balance? How to go about this? Well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, the fact that what you intend will all not always play out is going to be affected by a lot of factors. Uh, so what I would say is you really need to separate between. So now it depends on, you know, whether you're a startup or you're a more established player. Uh, I think if you're a startup, the gap between intended and where you end up can be very large. Uh, I think if you're a more established player and if you have a more thoughtful strategy, right? So if you articulate the strategy really in terms of what the goal is rather than the precise implementation, I think, uh, in fact, you know, the price, uh, precise implementation, I as a faculty member can always tell you, go implement it this way. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm not answerable to how well the implementation works. So the implementation is an iterative approach but kind of the goal, I think, is where you need to have sort of clarity and sort of something more stable. And to me, the goal is always one simple question. So how are we going to create value? If you have clarity about that, I think the gap between where you want to go and where you will end up, at least in terms of goals achieved, will not be very large. So let me just take example of Alibaba in this context. I think in my opinion, Alibaba has done a really good job in this regard. Did they start with? They started with the equivalent of basically, we had an information commons, Shopify, fundamentally Shopify. And you'll see how they had to create multiple commons, right? So basically, anybody, any, anybody can set up like a store on Alibaba and people can buy, whether it's industrial products or consumer products. They realized that there was a problem of trust. Right? I mean, how do I know that I go to Alibaba and uh, somebody trying to sell me is not trying to defraud me? So what did they have to do? They had to create a quality control commons, right? Which is the first thing, which says like, look, if somebody's on Alibaba, we give you some very basic sense that, you know, these are not going to rip you off, okay? So they had to create that. Notice that's a commons. They said, we have to add value in this sense. As time moves on, the next place where they realized is, look, I mean, people are paying. I can handle payment through, you know, let everybody, let everybody selling and everybody buying handle payment, or I could create a commons for payment and you have Alipay, right? And then they said, look, I mean, you know, now I've got information, I've got quality and I've got payment, but ultimately the product has to reach where it has to go. Let me create a warehousing commons and let me create a distribution commons, right? Notice, where they started is completely different from where they ended up. On the other hand, if I look at the goal was very clear. In fact, the next steps become, you know, you might not have thought about them before, but they become very natural. This is the same if you look at 7-Eleven Japan. 7-Eleven Japan started at the other end, started as a retailer. We're selling product. I'm a Kirana store. But of course, now they had the information commons and they had the distribution commons. Then they also had a payment commons because you know it's franchisees. So basically you have to have financial settlements on a daily basis with every franchisee. Then what did they say? Look, we have this infrastructure. So why don't we let people pay their bills? You see? What is paying bills going to use? It is going to use an information commons and a payment commons. Then they said, well, what's the problem with people uh, paying online? I mean, uh, ordering online and picking up with us. 
they come and visit us frequently. We are very close to their house. So again, you begin what you, what they did is they had a clear goal of creating value. Then they look at what they create and based on that, they keep adding products and services. So where they've ended up today is actually quite different. Home delivery, as the Japanese population ages, 7-Eleven Japan is implementing a lot of home delivery. You know, something the Kirana store has been doing for decades. You know, the Kirana store across my parents' home. I mean, most people who live in that area, they call him. They say, Yechaye, you know, dal, chawal, whatever it is. And uh, I don't know who brings it in now. In the old days, Chotu would come after one hour with the packet, right? Uh, just since Chotu came up, you know, I mean, talk of last mile delivery, where you want to go and where you end up. I don't know if you heard there was a Chotu.com. Uh, there was a Chotu.com. It doesn't exist anymore. But I really just want you to see, you know, the Kirana store has been doing last mile delivery at low cost for my entire lifetime so there is absolutely nothing new and modern it is just the swiggies of the world haven't figured out how to make money doing it but the kirana store has been doing it for 50 years i want you to understand that so there must be something the kirana store has that the swiggy is not able to replicate even today because the kirana store makes money while doing last mile delivery while providing credit to the people that live around while taking the phone call and taking the list of the items that need to be done, right? So imagine if we made this a bit more efficient. So, sorry, again, you know, I meandered a little bit, but hopefully that gives you some sense. Yes, yeah, so that, that was perfect answer right. from Mr. Yes. Shukla. Uh, so based on the time, available time, can we extend this session by five or 10 minutes or we have to end by 7.30? Uh, five at the most, because I am... Okay. I'm teaching from home. I'm, I'm talking to you from home, but I have to get to my office and I have a follow up commitment. So, in that case, let me summarize question which has been asked by Yaman Tripathi, Ritka Singh, Garima, and Nisharanjum, Sarat Chandra here, and uh, from the chat, Swati Patel, Sanan, Rishav, and Rag, Anshul Gautam, and Ria. Yes, I think I think the last question got up. Yes. So, so, the main question here is. Uh, India being a developed country, there are many players who are who don't have that much capital to invest in the technology or at least the initial investment. So how these things means how we can achieve resilient supply chain, sustainable supply chain with less cost. So I think, you know, to me, I will go back to the role so it's a third party and the question always is, can it be a private third party or not, right? And I will give you examples where it can be a private third party and examples where it cannot be a private third party in the sense it requires government intervention. Uh, let's take a simple example, right? I mean, all roads in India are largely built with government investment. I mean, that is the... Uh, biggest example of a commons, it provides a lot of resilience when one road is disrupted for some reason, I can take a different route, you know, but it also provides efficiency. Those are the roads that allow things to work efficiently, right? So it's like the Delhi bypass, right? Once the Delhi bypass has been built, everybody benefits, you know, people that live in Delhi and the people that, all the truck drivers that had to go through Delhi where there were all kinds of disruptions at all kinds of times. So I'll give you one example where the private sector just in the US, I'm going to give you this example, just cannot for a few, and I'll, you'll see everything I've spoken, there are really technical models sitting behind those. So the question is the oil crisis of the 70s, when there was an oil embargo, that's a supply disruption, okay? And basically there were long lines, prices of gasoline skyrocketed in the United States. What was the response? The response was the creation of a commons it's called the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, right? Which is used multiple times. In fact, it was used recently also with the war in Ukraine having started, right? So now the question is why can a private party not create this commons? 
And there are two major reasons for that. Let me look at the first one. Uh, the first one is crude by definition in general settings is what I will call a low variability product. It's not that demand is not fluctuating wildly, right? Which means that both on the production side and the inventory side, if you're a private party, you're really focused on efficiency and you're not carrying a ton of surplus inventory. And the producers are not producing a ton of additional crude. In fact, what they do is they set levels. OPEC goes and sets levels. And this supply chain should rightly be designed to be efficient without a ton of excess inventory. That's the right approach. So now, if, it, if that happens, it becomes less resilient by definition. Problem, <laughs> there is no incentive for anybody to carry a lot of excess inventory because now I become less efficient than my competitor. So one reason only the government can step up here is that the cost of resilience is very high. But there's a second important reason. Second important reason is correlation. A supply disruption hurts everybody, which means the impact is positively correlated across everybody. And when there is positive correlation, the benefit of aggregation is actually minimal. It's non-existent. So I just created a scenario where the only option is for the government to do this. Now, coming back, to India and the required commons, you know, if you look at, there are private efforts. So there are people that have recognized that if we could get these Kirana stores better organized, we can achieve something. However, I think, as you have pointed out, the level of investment is far less than it needs to be to accomplish this effectively. So to me, I would say this is an area where the government could consider, you know, I think it solves, in my opinion, it solves multiple issues. I would not worry about foreign players who are big box players. I would not worry about those because I can tell you in 25 years, they'll be dead. You just have to look at what's happening in the US, right? I mean, it's like, it's, there's no magic to it. I know it's going to happen. So if somebody wants to come and build a big box, I mean, be my guess, as long as they invest, at least it gives jobs, right? Uh, I think what we need to be worried about is really the future where we know there is going to be a slightly different version of the current resources. So when I say different version of the current resources, it's really going to be better equipped version of the current resources. Physically, we have the right resources in place. You, I think you can perhaps argue there are too many, even little retailers. There are too many little retailers. That is perhaps true. Even in the model I'm proposing, you will not need every little store that there is. That is, uh, we have to recognize that. On the other hand, you know, when we start investing in the commons, a lot of these players can begin to play other roles. So it's a long answer to your question, but to me, in the end, along with sort of private enterprise, which should think in terms of the value these commons can create, uh, I feel the government should pay, I mean, you know, should think about, uh, is there value to government investment in some of these commons. So I'll give you one commons, which it just pains me to see having been destroyed in India, the postal system. When I was a child, my first bank account was in the post office. That's where, you know, that, I, I, you guys are all young, so you probably, and you know, the post office delivered, it was a very important, I grew up in kind of, you know, a really remote part of India. I grew up in a place called Rawat Bhatta, which is 50 miles, you know, where the first nuclear plant was built, which is 50 kilometers from Kota. And you know, Kota was a sleepy place in those days. There wasn't the IIT coaching going on. Kota was a sleepy place and we were 50 kilometers from there. Believe it or not, there were tigers roaming around when I was a child in that general area. Right? It's still my favorite uh, part of India. 
uh, and uh, in you know in some sense uh, I would say the message I want to leave you with is the following that I think there's a real opportunity for both the private sector and the government to really you know, I don't know, work, work together is uh, probably not the right phrasing to use, but invest in settings that will be mutually beneficial. Well, Professor Sunil, we can have a quick question, one or two questions again. Um, Vikrant is asking, is collaboration, cooperation are ways to create commons? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I didn't Is is collaboration, co-optation are the ways to create commons? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, collaboration is a way to create a commons. I mean, for example, my suggestion to Amazon in the United States had always been to collaborate with Starbucks and actually use Starbucks as their hyper-local location. Uh, where they could carry a few products, maybe the 30 most popular products in that locality, hyper-local, and uh, Starbucks would also be a potential pickup location. Uh, so, you know, that would be an example of uh, <laughs> collaboration and, uh, uh, you know, uh, whatever way you describe it. Uh, but I think there are, in fact, what I'm describing with the Kirana stores is also ultimately a question of collaboration between the online players and this network like 7-Eleven Japan has created. Uh, the key is, you know, how do we create a network like 7-Eleven Japan uh, without necessarily having a chain? Okay, so related question is, is Uber or similar company in India? Ola are the commons of information. Oh, that's a, that's a whole discussion in itself. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, I would say from an information perspective, they are absolutely a commons and that's where they add value, right? Because what what is, you could always go stand on a street and try to look for a taxi or a, a scooter, three wheeler or something, and you know, try to wave and stop them. You could always do that. But what Uber and Ola have done is they provided an information commons that allows excess capacity, which is a taxi or a scooter sitting somewhere to link up to unmet demand, somebody looking for transportation. So there they provide a lot of value. I think the part which I always question is the step beyond that, uh, which is, so again, think about it. The question is, when does commons provide value? If you look at demand, demand occurs at two levels. There is the base load of demand and there is the uncertainty of demand, right? So if I look at transportation demand, there is base load. You know, I know if I'm in Mumbai and it is, uh, 5.30 in the evening, I mean, there's going to be a ton of demand around uh, whatever, you know, uh, church gate, wherever it is. So I, there is a base load, but there is uncertainty. So if you think of where does this information commons add value, it adds a lot of value on the uncertainty side. On the base load side, eh, not so clear, right? Because base load is a different story. And again, you know, I'm just a professor, so you can ignore what I'm about to say. I think the market and the investors don't always recognize that. That uh, uh, Ola and Uber, I think, add a tremendous amount of value on the uncertainty. I think they are value destroying on the base load. And last so question. Destroy value. So it's like, I, you know, I'm making a very strong statement. They destroy value on the base load because somebody is there making money, right? There's only so much total value created on the base load. And that was there before also. So they are value destroying. So, uh, you know, I think this is where, again, uh, I'm just a professor, so you can ignore. I've never, all I've had is one year off two of management training at Hindustan Levers, two weeks into which I decided I was not cut out for that. So, you know, it's like you can ignore what I'm about to say, but I think the problem today in investing in startups and all is there's a lot of money going into value destruction. 
So if we really separate out where there is value creation and value destruction, I think we'll be much better off. The last suggestion for this student means the question is from is from Akash Kaur, uh, Akash Kamble, Ariman Singh, and Pulkit. If from where they can learn new frameworks or application part of supply chain digital, uh, digital uh, supply chain or data analytics, etc., to build resilient supply chain. So we'll also answer those questions in our course work, but we'd like to hear from you. Sir. I would say, you know, it's like there is this is an area which, uh, you know, some of us have been doing research for a long time, but it is a very popular area of research. And I would say just look at uh, all the journals that are coming out and you will see a lot of work uh, being done in this space. Uh, you know, you just if I just think of the, my last three PhD students, you know, one of them worked in this space. I have been working with other collaborators in this space, and I am just one of hundreds of people who are working in this space. So I strongly encourage you to uh, look at, uh, you know, the latest research coming out. And uh, in particular, what I would say is you don't always need to go and read the technical portion of the research, but read the introduction, read the introduction, then look at sort of you know more sort of broad papers so i would encourage you you know so for decision sciences that's what i wrote last year which was around the commons but again you know i'm not the only one there are 100 people who do this better than me uh, so i encourage you to look at the research papers uh, and uh, focus on uh, try to understand what is the point that the author is making and you don't need to read more than the introduction to really understand what is the point that the author is making. Uh, I think the value of research is, uh, it's like you said, you know, what is intended versus what comes out. I'm very lucky. I only pay, get paid for saying what is intended. I don't get paid for what comes out. That is your problem. You're much smarter and more energetic than I am. So as other academics, what is intended is a great place to start because then you have the practical know-how, knowledge to see how it might be implemented a little better than I might suggest. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I'm Sini. going to make that the last question, if you don't mind. So we have completed all the questions. So actually, I have some guys on 10 questions into one. And thank you for the insightful session. And it was a really inter interactive session also. And I request Professor Singh to add few last words. And then I'll yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gaurav. So, yeah. so, Professor Sunil, so there was a commas in the question also. And that is why we created a common question to save the time. So I think it was a fantastic lecture by you. Uh, and I'm sure that in the future also, uh, if you get the time and, you know, uh, because getting a time from you from a busy schedule is uh, always a challenge, but definitely we will find some common time uh, between your time and our time. And so that we can keep on uh, interacting with you and learning, uh, you know, uh, from you. Uh, I think uh, uh, this uh, session was fantastic, uh, you know, informative. And not only the students, but also the supply chain practitioners, uh, such as Gora and me, who uh, closely work on the optimizing supply chain, and it will be very good. And our students also, I think that the the the, the quality or you know uh, just just uh, so so I'm sorry. So I am also from home. <laughs> I have the kid. Okay. So uh, so uh, I think uh, it is very important, uh, you know, uh, nowadays to implement the supply chain and to find the commerce. Unless we get the commons, you know, creating a network, as you rightly mentioned, the Kirana, like country like India has a lot of Kirana. So can we convert those Kirana into a chain of uh, maybe information distributor retailer so that they don't need to convert themselves to Flipkart or maybe Amazon, but they act like that. Inside, they may be a regular Kirana, but outside they are agent of uh, Amazon or uh, Flipkart. I think fantastic. And I also want to like the, your first question that really uh, you know uh, it 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 really we need to invest a lot to create you know efficiency and the resilience you know the first question and when you said that uh, you know you don't need to invest a lot basically you need to rethink how it has to be designed so i think it's a fantastic example i think uh, you know for me the learning is common today and i think i'm definitely going to read your your paper decision science how you know we can better utilize this concept of the common 
So, Professor Sunil, I think uh, thank you very much for uh, taking out the time from your space schedule. Uh, we are really thankful to I, on the behalf of the Department of Manual Studies, IIT Delhi, uh, you know, uh, 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 really thankful that you have take, given the time to a student or to faculty like us who are doing working on supply chain management. Thank you very much, sir. And we hope that in the future also, uh, I think uh, you, uh, you extract the time uh, once we request you for, you know, uh, giving such insightful, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, learning from what you have taught for the for last more than 20 years of the time. Thank you very much, sir. Sure. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Thank Professor you. Singh. And uh, do we have Professor Rao, uh, Shantan Rao, or Professor Pritha here? Anyone? Yes. Yeah, I'm there. Thank I just don't want to keep uh, yes. Professor Chopra held up anymore. I know he yes. is. So you can thank him, him from the institute uh, side. Say that it was yeah. it was a fantastic lecture, and you know we we really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank it's you, a sir. pleasure. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Thank you, sir.